All right. So hello, everyone. There we go. Um, my name is Emily. I work in Advancement and Alumni Relations here at Wabash. Um, and tonight we have with us Dr. Molly Abels, who is a visiting assistant professor of music. She's been at Wabash since 2017 and has degrees from Baylor, the University of Texas, and IU Bloomington. And those will come in handy later. Um, she teaches classes in music history and theoretical fundamentals. Mm -hmm. She has also taught several interdisciplinary courses, um, including topics like music's role in Christianity, the history of music videos, and how music is used in social conflict. And her research focuses on sacred music in Baroque Venice, as well as digital platforms for understanding musical cultures. So that is enough from me. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Abels. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. The floor is yours. Why, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Correct, Robert, if it ain't Baroque. I'm not studying it. Okay, sharing the screen. Uh, I see a couple former students in uh, in the Zoom and it is really, really lovely to see you. Uh, so hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much to uh, Emily for coordinating all this. This is a really cool event and one of the many things I, I love about being in the Wabash community. So uh, I'm in the music department here at Wabash. I mostly teach classes on history and the sociology of music. Uh, my degree is in musicology, which means that I spend a lot of time explaining what musicology is. So it is often easiest to explain that I'm a very specific kind of historian. I look at music as a historical cultural product, uh, similar to how an art historian might look at a specific piece of artwork as representative of a time and style. So uh, I once had a professor uh, say that music sounds the way it does because people made choices. And those choices represent an intersection of societal norms, practices, policies, countless other factors. So furthermore, the music we hear and how we hear it also reflects those same factors. So what music is available to perform or listen to reflects a complex ecosystem of artists, producers, publishers, consumers, and various cultural gatekeepers, and they're constantly dynamic. So musicologists can be just as concerned with how specific music sounds as they are with the circumstances that created it. So we see examples of music as a way to understand societies and institutions. So uh, my presentation today is somewhat based on a presentation that I did for Big Bash uh, back in 2019, and if any of you were in attendance. Uh, the theme was Wally first and 10. And so I decided to do a talk about college fight songs and what we could learn about them. And so at that point, I was still pretty new to Wabash. Uh, and so I approached, I, I, I quickly became aware that Wabash has a lot of traditions. And I approached all these traditions, especially the musical ones with a kind of uh, anthropological curiosity. And so after doing the Big Bash presentation, I realized just how useful uh, the song Old Wabash is in demonstrating concepts and methodologies that are key to many of my classes. So uh, here is a selected list of the courses I've taught and are teaching at Wabash. Uh, the courses on in the left column, uh, I uh, offer um, at least two of these every semester. So this semester I'm teaching 101 Music and Society 107, which is a basic music theory course and uh, 205 the European music before 1750. So 205 and 206 are survey courses that are currently requirements for the music major. They're very common requirements for music majors everywhere. They were required for me when I got uh, my degrees, uh, but collectively uh, my discipline is rethinking this approach. We're trying to get away from Eurocentric narratives of great master composers. This is problematic for several reasons. So I and other musicologists are instead focusing more on abstract concepts and methodologies. And we want to equip students with the tools to study music of any culture or style. So rather than focusing on a canon of, you know, quote unquote, essential works, we want to approach it more as a series of case studies. So I'm going to uh, put something else on the screen. This is 
Uh, yeah, so here is uh, the PDF of uh, my current 101 class. So this is the schedule. Notice it says the schedule will definitely change. Uh, quickly becomes a work of fiction by October. So um, let's see here. Starting last spring, I've started the course with a module on methodologies. In the past, I've taught this more like a so-called music appreciation course, so which in which you introduce students to different classical pieces, usually chronologically. Um, but what I've done instead is I have uh, several week, uh, several classes at the, be at the beginning of the semester where we learn how to do stylistic analysis, how to use cultural historical pro approaches, uh, what does it mean to do reception history, uh, what does it mean to work with primary sources, um, and then from there on out, it's uh, case, select case studies from history. So we're avoiding like a stylistic uh, evolutionary narrative uh, instead. So uh, I've incorporated talking about old Wabash into uh, my classes because first of all, it's really interesting and a very good example. And it's a topic that will resonate with just about all the students in, in one way or another. So I'm going to stop sharing here. So uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've always been fascinated by music and pageantry at football games. I feel particularly qualified uh, to talk about this because, well, first of all, I'm a musicologist, but also I am a native Texan. So uh, I'm from Kerrville, which is a small town in the Texas Hill Country. Uh, you'll recognize that name if you watch the most recent Johnny Manziel documentary. Anybody? Yeah, so my, my dad is the PA announcer for all of Tyvee High School's football games, uh, has been for the past 30 years. Uh, hello from Dallas, Big D. Uh, so yeah, if you listen very closely uh, to the documentary from the uh, uh, Tyvee footage, you can hear my dad over the PA. So the culture there, extremely Friday Night Lights, uh it's lots of high school football driving the culture and so as a budding musicologist going to these games as a child i understood fight songs as rhetorically powerful both implicitly and explicitly uh, they represent the values of a lot of very specific institutions so i want to change the subject but not the topic uh to my research so one of the things i research is music and ritual and renaissance and baroque italy so this includes ritual in a religious liturgical sense so meaning elements of the catholic mass but also civic ritual how music was used by different institutions to convey significance or agenda so for example uh renaissance venice uh had very had different organizations that regularly uh, pos uh processed through the city to mark different religious feast days which doubled as civic holidays and so these processions were almost always accompanied by music and there was a very specific hierarchy that dictated uh which music was played for what occasion here is an another later depiction of this phenomenon so uh in this in this part of the procession right here, uh, we see a depiction of musicians playing very long silver trumpets. The trumpets themselves are historically significant objects, and they were only played on the most important feast days when the doge, the elected uh, leader of Venice, and his whole retinue would process through the city. So we have a specific brass instrument uh, with uh, uh, historical significance. A, I, these, the parallels with the Monon bell are, are, are not lost on me. So uh, music was used to communicate uh, civic ideas, ideals via oral and visual association. So music such as fight songs represent several more layers of meaning because they have words and they have melodies. So some of them have become associated with a specific school or a team over time while others were written expressly specifically for that school or an event at that school so as it did in renaissance venice and baroque venice the music becomes more of a more than a means of aesthetic association but an inherent component 
of a school's cultural identity, especially at Wabash. So I want to discuss fight songs as representing intersections of power structures. So who is in charge, who is important when the songs were composed and how does the song reflect that? Uh, of course, aesthetics, what does it sound like? What makes it identifiable? Uh, and practice and repetition. So a fight song might be written for a specific school, but it only becomes meaningful through regular and purposeful component uh, performance. This is where the component of ritual comes in. You know, there were uh, other songs written uh, by Carol Reagan that do not have the carry the same weight that Old Wabash does because Old Wabash was subject through the regular and purposeful uh, rep repetitive performance. So I'm going to discuss two case studies. The first of which is Wabash Cannonball, no relation, and of course, Old Wabash. So let's uh, go to the central time zone. So Wabash Cannonball is a song played at University of Texas football games. Uh, technically, it's not a fight song, but it is an essential part of the UT game day experience because the Longhorn Band always plays it between third and fourth quarters. It's an, uh, the song Wabash Cannonball is a 20th century folk song about a train and it was popularized by the Carter family, by Roy Acuff, by Johnny Cash, and other artists. So I'm going to play you uh, a Roy Acuff rendition, and then I'm going to play the uh, Longhorn Band re uh, rendition, the marching band ver version of this. <laughs> Yes, yes. All right, so the Longhorn Band started playing this in 1970 after UT had won their third national championship, Hook of Horns. So, yes, Mike Boyd, that is Daryl K. Royal uh, in the photo. And so the band director asked this gentleman right here, Daryl K. Royal, now the namesake of the uh, UT football stadium, if he had any suggestions for what the band uh for what the band should play uh so royal was a country music fan and he wanted the band to play more country music and he suggested wabash cannonball which is now a defining song in their repertory uh so the origins of the fight song reflect contemporary power structures because the song itself it has no relationship to ut no relationship to the state of texas and no relationship to football even it's played for no other apparent reason that the per, uh, than the personal preferences of Daryl K. Royal, who is unquestionably a powerful figure at the university. So the, the aesthetics of the song are an extension of this. So the rhythm, the texture, the tempo uh, mark the song as a mid 20th century uh, folk country. And so this is differentiated from the typical marching band aesthetics. And that distinction has become an important part of the UT game day experience. The Wabash Cannonball is played at every football game, specifically before the fourth quarter. So this repetition and specific practice make playing the song an act of ritual, which infuses it with a special meaning. And depending on how UT is playing, it infuses it with a specific function. You know, are we celebrating? Are we rallying what, you know, what the tone of, even though the notes do not change, the tone and purpose definitely does. So I do want to make mention of another unofficial UT fight song, which is The Eyes of Texas. Uh, and there was a registrant who uh, mentioned this uh, song in uh, their RSVP, and I want to thank them for that. 
So uh, the Eyes of Texas, uh, it's officially the uh, alma mater, but it's sung up tempo whenever UT scores a touchdown. So it also functions as a fight song. The melody for the Eyes of Texas are is a uh, a is I've been working on the railroad. So the eyes of Texas are upon you, etc. And I've been working on the railroad is one of the many American folk and early pop songs that were popularized by blackface minstrelsy. So indeed, uh, the students debuted the eyes of Texas at a campus minstrel show. So uh, there is a pretty complicated and somewhat ugly uh, past here. So amidst other social upheaval of 2020, many students, many alumni, uh, many administrators, uh, many faculty wanted the UT band, marching band to stop playing it. And, uh, uh, but of course, uh, others vehemently fought for it to stay. So uh, UT formed a special committee on the topic in 2021 and as far as i know uh it's still in the band's repertory so uh you may have noticed uh from uh my earlier slide that uh, i've taught a course on music and social conflict and i'll be offering it again this fall and uh i'll be that was the last time i taught it was 2020 that's before the official eyes of texas history committee report came out so i will absolutely be making this a part of my lecture on blackface minstrelsy and its legacies in America, because the, the role of power uh, structures is particularly relevant here. So uh, before I move on to uh, the less problematic uh, old Wabash, I, I, I just wanted to pause and see if there are, are any questions. Emily, has anybody contacted you? There is a lot of talking in the group chat but it's mostly sharing reflections on the songs i don't see oh i love it i don't see besides is that daryl royal which we discussed um yes, lots of yes. folks saying hi they're also from various areas of texas which i love um <laughs> looks like professor i will share the chat with you when we're done because i'm recording it okay. um there's a lot of really cool memories of folks singing wabash cannonball in the glee club here oh really at I, wabash. I, I, yeah i did not know there was uh yeah, Jay, I think you're correct. Yeah, the, the UT committee cleared the eyes of Texas for U, for UT games, right? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated issue, uh, and everyone has a lot of opinions on it. I, I'm loving seeing some of these uh, reflections. Oh, Glee Club tour of 1978. Oh man, that sounds like fun. Okay, well, if there are no uh, specific questions. Uh, what you all came for. Uh, let's talk about uh, old Wabash. So one of, one of some many, many important differences here. So uh, this piece is written specifically with the college in mind um, and was written and rather than the song being co-opted by the school or just lyrics rewritten by the school. Uh, I doubt that I need to review uh, the origins of the song for this audience, much less play it to remind you how it sounds. But I, I do want to point out how the structure of the song and the history of the song uh, relates to power and aesthetics. So first of all, the two students that wrote it, Carol Reagan and Edwin Mead Robinson, they did so because the college offered a prize of $50. So this is a very clear power dynamic. You have the commissioner of the song and you have musicians writing it toward a specific purpose. And so uh, furthermore, the first official performance was at the inauguration of a new president in 1900, in 1900. So the melody for Old Wabash existed before the lyrics, which in this case is dictating the aesthetics of the song. Uh, it was conceived for marching band, which explains the tempo, the cadence, and above all, uh, the length. So anybody who has ever uh, um, been in a marching band, uh, you literally have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, and so what you see a lot of in uh, Sousa marches or other uh, pieces for marching band is you have a series of uh, melodies that uh, each have their own identity. Uh, so uh, Old Wabash has, I have a recording here, but I don't think that's necessary. Oops, I'm trying to advance and I'm getting the spinny beach ball. 
Okay, let me stop my share for just a second. Someone will be right with you. Your call is very important to us. Oh no, Emily. Yes, we practice this, <laughs> I promise, folks. <laughs> I know, yeah, can yeah, can, uh, can somebody juggle or something while I figure this out? All right, well, last time Mr. Coulter brought on his dog. I wonder <laughs> if the Coulter family dog is around. <laughs> it is blind and learned oh. how to feel its way. Well, last the last half of the bell, we were talking about color vision and animals. So we were mm -hmm. talking about how this specific dog learned how to get away, get around the house, like with Aww. paws and his whiskers. It was very cute. Aww. All right. We're voguing and we're voguing. Folks, this would be a great yeah. time, too. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute right now and shout them out or share where you're from in Texas while Dr. Abel's. Well, uh, I, you know, I, I might just have to uh, have to go analog here, uh, which, which, which is OK. Um, you can also uh, email me your PowerPoint if you want, and I can screen share. I, I think, you know, I think uh, I think that we're we're mostly done with the visuals, so we, okay. we, we can just move on. But it, if necessary, yeah, the spinny beach ball of death. Yeah, you know, I think I think uh, we're nothing short of a hard reset is going to help here. So these things happen. Uh, let's see here. Oh, presiding judge in Dallas. Huh. <laughs> my, my, so my dad. Yeah, my, my, my dad's a judge in Texas. I'll have to see if he if he knows about this. Uh, so let's see here. Okay, so as you are all extremely aware, uh, there are three main sections uh, in, in Old Wabash. The verse, the refrain, the chorus, each with their own melodies, each with uh, their uh, each with variations in key and in meter and in style. So I use Old Wabash a lot for 107, which is my basic music theory class. So understanding, uh, teaching students how to uh, read rhythms, how to read pitches, how if if they wanted to write and read music, they would be able to do so. So uh, part one, the From the Hills of Maine, is in C major and is in 6-8 time. Part two, same key, same meter, but it's in a very different style. Uh, so as you all know, you have da 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 It has a very kind of direct, very stepwise pattern. Uh, but uh, our prayers are always on the hearts among the... Yeah, it has that kind of slippery chromaticism. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of faces like I'm looking at sleeper agents who are like, oh, <laughs> responding viscerally to that. So, but part three, there is a key change and a meter change. So you go from six, eight time in C major to four, four time in F major. So our greatest joy will be to shout the chorus. Uh, steer. And so now you are in F major. So 4-4 four, four time is an example of what we call simple meter. So if your beat is this, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, each beat is divided equally into two beats. So one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and six, eight is, an, is what we call a compound meter. So your beats are one, two, one, two. And instead of divided evenly into two, they're divided, <laughs> nice. Uh, they're divided evenly into three beats. So it's one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, or one, a, one and a two and a one and a two and a one and a two and a, so. <laughs> So, but the important thing is even though you're going back and forth between a simple and a compound meter, so that same beat is the same. If you are in a marching band, you're never going to break your step, even though the meter is completely different. This is something that you see a lot of in um, in uh, in two step marches. You know, you want to have variety, but you have to maintain the constant beat. So this, so in my uh, fundamentals class, when I'm like, this is, you know, when you're teaching your freshmen. Uh, the song for chapel sing next year, you know, make sure you can use this and they never do. So the parts one and two 
uh, all the parts are very much linked, but parts one and two sound odd when they're performed independently of one another. The same is definitely not true of the chorus. That's why it's our greatest joy to shout it, maybe. So the chorus is arguably the most iconic part. Um, it, the chorus is the most iconic part for a lot of songs. Um, and should time be an issue, uh, which might be often the case with a Wabash fight song, uh, the chorus could stand in for the whole piece. So I don't know how many of you were privileged enough to get uh, the uh, Christmas card from then President Hess in 2018. Uh, but I was delighted. You know, I had only been at Wabash for about a year and a half, and I get I get a Christmas card, and here's what happens. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> All right. So uh, did anyone else get this Christmas card? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I keep this in my office. Um, and when the batteries die, which, you know, they all do, it's going to be very upsetting. Uh, this is a really, really great teaching tool for my 101 students when I'm introducing them to primary sources uh, and to source studies. You know, what is this example of material culture? Uh, tell us about so many things, like how Wabash is deciding to represent itself. Uh, yeah, and also celebrate the holiday. So moving on, I want to bring, I want to uh, maybe, uh, Yes, it's Colin McKinney's a good person to know for several reasons among that, yeah. So let's talk about the act of practice and repetition. And uh, that is probably best represented uh, by chapel sing. So uh, during homecoming week, I, I like to ask my uh, Music 101 students, just kind of as a thought experiment, I say, is chapel sing, is chapel sing a concert and the immediate response is always no 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 but you know i i asked some um prodding follow-up observations while i say i don't know you have people singing in some in front of an assembled audience you know you practice something you rehearsed um people are paying attention paying attention very closely and so uh just just playing devil's advocate. So they seeded that while it shared elements with a concert, that creating music was not the primary goal. And so this is an interesting wrinkle with, with fight songs, but also any kind of uh, ritual. So uh, as in uh, the religious liturgy, the text and the actions, they're what make a service rather than the melodies setting them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, some music and ritual does not need to have text in order to carry a specific meaning. So, for example, Wabash Cannonball it is just the melody. Uh, the, um, uh, the actual text of the song would actually uh, undercut uh, its significance for the University of Texas uh, because it's, it's about a train that is nowhere near Texas. Uh, but you have uh, this, but old Wabash cannot be fully appreciated without the words. But if I said, na 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 na, yeah, there would still be a, an emotional response. So in football and religion, singing only the melody of a song can be representative of the text. Um, so both are important in, in equal but very different ways, uh, but uh, one can stand in for the other. And this, is, this theory is stress tested when you go to uh, uh, chapel sing because uh, everyone is singing together for a little bit and then but it dissolves pretty quickly uh so there are aspects of the fight song that might uh, fight song performance that might define it such as the words the meter the cadence you know hand gestures of course well-placed woos depending on uh, what school you go to um 
I understand that there is another school about half an hour down 231 uh, that you know spells the name of their mascot at the end. Uh, good for them, they could spell, I guess. Uh, so there are other, plenty of other elements that make fight songs what they are that are not, uh, that are not musical. And that's important when you're talking about a, a ritualized act, that you have all these other extra musical uh, components uh, that are compounded uh, by however many years of repetition. So uh, this repetition, it creates a continuity uh, between the graduating classes at Wabash. And I don't think this could be better demonstrated than uh, this assembled Zoom call. Uh, so uh, with, with that, uh, I think I will uh, uh, see if anybody, <laughs> they do not spell Danny, can they? Uh, uh, with that, I think uh, I will pause and take uh, some of your questions if you, if you have any. This is the time where it is okay and in fact encouraged to unmute yourselves, fellows. Yes, I know please. I was strict about that in the beginning, but go ahead now. I, this is this is Rob Shook in Austin, Texas, uh, an old Woo! old Glee Club member, class of 1983. Oh wow! Hi. A uh, question I have for you is: Do we think that there has been any migration uh, or editing or changes to the words or the melody over time since it was written? It's great that we have sort of the original original writing of this, but has there been any pressure or for whatever reason, any editing of the song that we know of? That's a really, really good question. And that's definitely some uh, something that uh, other schools have had to deal with. So like we know uh, uh, that school down south, uh, they had to edit uh, their lyrics at some point in the mid 20th century because uh, uh, it was uh, it had purely masculine pronouns and uh, and of course uh, to make things more inclusive they understandably changed the words um so we're yeah we're lucky to have uh as many primary sources uh for old wabash as we do and as far as i know i mean uh beth swift could probably answer this in a heartbeat uh there haven't been any uh changes uh, to the text, uh, usually tech changes happen when it's necessary or there is something that's objectionable. And uh, as far as uh, I can tell, there hasn't been any concern for that. But that's definitely something that other uh, schools have had to deal with. If I could go off on one one brief tangent, so uh, I mentioned the UT fight songs, but um, the A and M, the Texas A and M fight song and the UT fight song are very much related to one another because the the actual Texas fight song is, uh, Emily, feel free to sing along, is Texas fight, Texas fight, and it's goodbye to A and M, Texas fight, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, which, you know, so they play the fight song regardless of who they're playing. Just uh, A and M is just forever, um, uh, on the radar is some guess, some a team that they need to beat um but did they change the lyrics when a and m went to the sec not as far as i know uh so uh yeah and similarly there is i don't know the whole um aggie fight song it is um uh pretty uh cumbersome from what I understand, but there is a uh, there's a whole section that talks about sawing off the Longhorns horns. Um, yeah, so a little, a little more graphic. Um, so but no need to update it, first of all, for animal cruelty, but also because UT is not in your uh, conference anymore. So uh, sometimes uh, uh, remaining keeping the words relevant, if it's if it's a choice between keeping words relevant and uh, adhering to tradition, tradition will usually win the day. So that's I, 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 have, a I, I have a question. Yes. This is Jim Hawksworth, class of 95. Um, Hello. Hi. Um, so, like, you notice that Old Wabash is very stylistically different than the typical fight song kind of melody that, that we all think of, like Notre Dame and Michigan and, like, some of the more popular 
spite songs like that. Is that mostly just of the time that Old Wabash was written? Mm -hmm. Like, were the other fight songs written later than yeah. than that? And because they all they all tend to sound very similar as well, right? And yeah, Wab Old Wabash doesn't sound like any of those. So I'm just wondering if it's a timing thing. Yes, uh, uh, from from what I can tell, yes, uh, because you normally the uh, the the invention of this in general the invention of the fight song coincides with the invention of the pet band mm -hmm. and or the invention of the marching band so if you have a marching band you know that's not exactly the same thing as you know playing in a pet band uh but you are going to be uh you're going to be writing for specific in instruments and uh instruments that are going to be uh you know moving over time as opposed to pet band which shares a lot of the instruments but uh, can have a little more flexibility and also they're usually going to stay in place and maybe play through a song once but then several times sporadically throughout the performance so it so it definitely from what i can tell <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Oh, I, I, I've got two of my own. No, uh, yeah, I, I barely hear barking anymore. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it ha it sounds the way it does because of the instruments it was written for and the uh, function of those ensembles, usually. that. So there's a very fight song aesthetic. They all kind of sound like cheer, cheer for old Notre Dame. Um, yeah, and that kind of early 20th century brass quick step march aesthetic yes yeah. dr abels i saw that um hugh mcclelland had his hand up so i want to make sure that we get his oh question. yes hello abels, thank thank uh, i appreciate your work on this and it's just a comment uh, more more uh, not a question and the comment is that uh, i just uh, we the class 72 had their 50th reunion last year and i gotta tell you uh <laughs> I had, uh, uh, I felt more pressure um, um, remembering old Wabash from my <laughs> and than I did from my freshman year uh, in 1968. So how about that? Oof, oof. Yeah, well, you know, you probably weren't practicing it multiple times a day under yeah, well, and, and, and my memory this day is not the same as it was. <laughs> <before>. <laughs> So Dr. Abel's no, a, uh, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, doc, I'm sorry, I'm on my iPhone, uh, so I can't raise my hand. Uh, this is John Bridge, classmate oh. of Hugh McClelland, uh, class of 1972, and four-year member of the Glee Club. One thought I have about the words, and I believe there's an old, old recording, which maybe you're going to play tonight, of the 1908 Glee Club singing it, but it's oh. much, more like a, much more like a ballad, and yeah. especially the words of the second part, Mm -hmm. You know, are very sentimental, um, obviously looking back on college days. Yes. It's, so it's, it's almost like written for alumni mm -hmm. rather than students. And it's yeah. hardly a fight song. There's nothing about killing the opponent or, you know, <laughs> beating anybody into oblivion or anything like that. So I just wonder, maybe you'll get into that. But I just wanted to make that point that uh, yeah. to me, it almost has uh, aspects of a ballad rather than a fight song. That, that is a really excellent point, and uh, I'm going to have to remember that the next time I uh, bring up this with my 101 students about um, uh, stylistic analysis. Uh, so with a lot of fight songs, uh, the common theme is you know, there, there's an adversary, and if we, are, if we ourselves are not doing the pummeling, then we are uh, cheering on uh, the, the pummeling. Uh, yeah, but you're right, there, uh, there is no violent imagery to speak of uh it, it in old old wabash yeah it is a it, it's a it, it's a love song to the college and also a celebration of uh of alumni and this a celebration of the devotion itself so yeah that's an excellent that's an excellent point and i think a, a textual analysis uh would be a really beneficial thing for uh some of my students to do so thank you for that Hey, uh, this is Bill Cadis, class of 77 in Columbus, Ohio. 
And I live in the heart of OSU Buckeye land, just <laughs> across the street from the tomb of Coach Woody Hayes, indeed a sacred site. Um, <laughs> the OSU fight songs are kind of short and to the point. Yes. And the thought occurs to me that uh, having sung Old Wabash and appearing in uh, other college fight songs, it's the longest one that I know of that I personally witnessed. And I wonder if there's something in in the symbolism of a small school having a very <laughs> long elaborate fight song Do yeah you have comments on that I, I you know i it always strikes me uh, it should not have caught on you know it ha it doesn't have any of the more traditional markers of a good fight song it's it uh, a good fight song like uh like you like uh ohio state but you know also texas tech you know it's a nice neat like maybe 16 bars and a very clear message you know go fight win uh and it, it doesn't it, yeah so the wabash song is long it's about our feelings uh it's musically complicated uh it should not caught on like it did but i think that's uh, paradoxically uh and also because wabash students uh famously um believe in hard work um they uh they they kind of adopted it because it was such an anomaly uh so that that's that that's a that's a really really good question um at my very 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 first semester uh at wabash so this is fall of 2017 uh, i'm teaching a my 101 class so i step into the classroom at wabash for the very first time and uh and so i'm asking i'm trying to get a sense of the room like how can we talk about music so you know when i say instrumentation what do i mean when i say texture what do i mean that sort of thing i'm like oh i know i'll um I'm sure I'm sure the school has a fight song. Uh, maybe if I, uh, you know, maybe if they sing it for me, uh, we can talk about that. And I said, uh, can y'all sing your fight song? Who knows a fight song? And they're like, yeah, we know it. And I said, go sing it. And they're like, hey, you sure? <laughs> and like, so however many minutes later, I'm like, what have I done? So I had made the assumption that it was going to be short. Uh, it was going to be very simple. And my expectations were immediately subverted. So in that moment, I'm like, I am somewhere different. I am somewhere that does things differently. So I, I, I feel like uh, the, I don't know if this was on purpose, but I, but I feel like the song is representative of that. Uh, Bill Barnett here, class of 64, Glee Club yeah. member and so forth. I've sung Old Wabash and the alma mater more times than I can count. And um, I recognize that there was a lot of pressure in the college for everybody to learn the song. You mentioned chapel sing and so forth, and we all went through that. And uh, that happened also to my father, who graduated in 1932, uh, and uh, an uncle uh, about the same time. They were all uh, pressured to learn both songs in, in, in the same way. Uh, if you didn't learn it, you had your head shaved off in the, in, uh, the shape of a W. Uh, so I'm just curious if you know when that began. It shouldn't have caught on, but when did it uh, become really intense pressure to learn it? Yeah, that is a uh, that is such an excellent question. I wish I had an answer for you. So that so if you were in one of my classes, I I'd say yeah, it's such a cop out. Uh, I'd say, gosh, I don't know, but let's talk about how we can find out. Uh, so so maybe we can't answer that question directly, but I'm sure we have an entire backlog of issues of the Bachelor or the Caveman in the, in the archives. So I'm there. I'm sure there is uh documented uh, this newfangled thing called uh chapel sing i imagine that uh there wasn't a whole lot of overlap between chapel sing and say the uh the freshman scrap uh so you know because uh you know the, these uh, these traditions they're markers of time and of course they're going to be observed and um so uh, I, I think if we can find events that are tangential uh, to uh, to the song, that's uh, that's where we can kind of uh, create uh, some lineage. So, uh, Chris Barker, hi, Chris. Hello. 
Yeah, uh, Chris was one of my students. I think it was what my 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 second year. So yeah, still trying to figure figure it out. So he said, uh, we need Beth Swift here too. Gosh, yeah. Uh, uh, so I remember one time I I took a group of students to the Wabash Archives, you know, as part of this. Uh, 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 you know, understanding primary sources, how to do, how to work with um, older materials, you know how to, what kinds of questions to ask. Uh, so many things are digitized now uh, that the students have so much more access to the Wabash archives. Uh, but I remember uh, posing a rhetorical question um, to the students. I said, "Well, how long does it take for something to become a tradition?" You know, you know rhetorical question. I try not to do those. Uh, and, you know, just thinking it would be like this big philosophical debate. And and, and Beth Swift, uh, without missing a beat, said, four years. And I'm like, oh, oh I, I didn't realize there was a number. But she, she made the excellent point that if a new tradition starts when you're a freshman, by the time you're a senior, it has always been that way in your mind. Um, and so, uh, and so you as a freshman are going to pass on this tradition that maybe was new the year you started. You're going to pass this on to the sophomores and that repetition, a practice is just going to compound it, its importance exponentially. Uh, there's, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've you know, heard current students talking about uh, the senior arch. No, you're not supposed to go beneath the senior arch. You'll fail your comps if you go beneath the senior arch, but that, that used to be a street, right? You had to <laughs> go. Be yeah, so uh, the, these uh, these objects, these uh, practices, they, they take on new meaning. They're, they're very dynamic in that sense. Um, and so, yeah, at, like you said, at some point, getting a W was not a good thing. Getting the W at Chapel Singh was a bad thing. Now it's what you're what you're striving for. You you want you want to get the W. And um uh uh that's an excellent point, Rob. Yep. So the the students and the administrators, yeah, we, we get to uh curate some traditions, which is which is a which is a privilege. Uh but but yeah the um the chapel sing is a tradition that has existed for a long time but chapel sing looks very very different and so the uh the ontological question the kind of ship of theseus idea of you know at what point does it stop being uh that tradition if everything is different about it and i will let my uh colleagues in the philosophy department take that on Uh, I have a question, uh, Kyle Cassidy, class of 08. You mentioned earlier some of Carol Reagan's other compositions. And yes. I was wondering, do you discuss those in your class? Because when you mentioned, <laughs> yeah. sorry about that, when you mentioned the socioeconomic implications of the composition of music, I mean, I thought immediately of Reagan's Wabash War Song mm. and some of the interesting things that that reflects in the way that it talks about the Civil War and the way that it talks about the, you know, I believe the expression in the song is the marching hun that the young men of Wabash are going off to fight. I just right. wondered, do you ever discuss that in your classes or do you have any thoughts on those? Yeah. So um, a, a couple of years ago, I, I did. Um, yeah, I've got a PDF because uh, yeah, PowerPoint won't let me do anything. But I will. I, this is uh, some pictures I've taken of from the music archives uh, in the Lilly Library. And so these are, here's a collection of songs that were apparently very important at one point, uh, published by Albert L. M. Elmore in Waynetown. Um, I, uh, yeah, who's also the composer here. Um, I, has anyone here ever sung Coming Back to Old Wabash? Okay, at one point, substitution may be used for Old Wabash. Yeah, at one point these were interchangeable, which is somewhat unthinkable today. Um, let me see what else I got here. Yeah, Song of the Alumni, uh, music by Carol Reagan. Uh, is anyone familiar with this song? OK. 
Okay. Uh, let's see here. Alma mater, of course. And uh, someone put in the chat that uh, you know everyone used to sing the the all three verses of the alma mater. Yeah. Let's see here. I think that might. Oh yeah, to the scarlet. Uh, words and music by Joe S. Miller, published by the Wabash Athletic Association. Okay. So here we see a little more typical fight song rhetoric. They fought like men. What they did then will make the little giants bold, rah, rah. Um, but again, everything is in past tense. So it's like they are anticipating uh, alumni singing this. Uh, yeah, to the Scarlet, tempo, D march, naturally. Bum, 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 bum uh let's see here and i think there's no i think that's it so uh that's uh i think only one of those i think was um by carol reagan but there's a pretty uh interesting uh, uh selection there i've got uh i think no that's not it just a second one more that I want to share with you from the Thomas Ristine collection of sheet music. Uh, so I, I those other songs I, I, I have showed my students just to show like at one point, these may have been just as important in, as old Wabash, uh, but they were not canonized in the way the old Wabash is. And that's a very useful thing for me because I, I like to stress how important it is to be critical of historical narratives when we're talking about music, uh, because there's this idea that there is a musical canon. Songs that have <laughs> the songs that have endured haven't uh, have done so because they're great works, and this composer was a genius, and uh, you know that they're definitely great works, and um, people are definitely talented. Uh, but there are some there there are circumstances we can't even. Uh, uh, think about that impact, why some things endure and why some things don't. So we can't always assume that it's because a particular song is better or that a composer was a genius and others weren't. Uh, we have to consider all of the factors as to why something endures. Uh, I want to share uh, one more thing. So this is something I like to show my students. Uh, can anyone tell me what this is? Looks like the first verse to me. <laughs> yeah, Chris, Chris, I know you can read music. So if you can you, look here, six, eight time. -na 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 -na. Yeah, so it is uh, a it's the melody written for mandolin. And here you see it says Reagan here at the top. So this is a transcription of the melody for mandolin. Why? Because the Glee Club, before it was the Glee Club, it was the uh, uh, Glee Club slash Mandolin Club, uh, which is just a funny little wrinkle. So yeah, here we have more songs of old Wabash, the alumni song. Oh, here we go. The Beta Pioneers, also by Carol Reagan. So he's representing his uh, fraternity there. Yeah. And uh, if I ever had beta, like you guys know, you guys probably know this. I'm like, mm. No. Are there any betas in the Zoom that, that recognize this? There's old Wabash. Let's see. Do I have? Yeah, I, I thought I had a picture of the Glee Club and Mandolin Society, uh, which apparently Carol Reagan was a member of in the uh, uh, in, in the in the aughts, in the early aughts. Uh, so why mandolins? Well, they're smaller and cheaper and easier to play than guitars. And uh, at, a, at a time before everyone had recordings they could play, you know, being able to uh, port around your own accompaniment was, uh, was, was pretty useful. 
Uh, let's see here. Might there be a relative of, of Carol Reagan living in Crawfordsville who could be used as a source for your students? That's a really great question. I hadn't considered that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, should be drawing more on uh, the the community knowledge there. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Molly? Check this on the football. Is okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll be at the Bell game, so I'll look for him. I know there's a game going on, but do you have a second to talk about primary sources? Ned, did you have a question? You want to go ahead? Uh, I think it was answered. Yes. Uh, and this is Ned Luce, class of 66. One of my classmates is Cal Black, who mm -hmm. is Carol Black, and he's a descendant of Carol Reagan's. Oh. And okay. he lives in Crawfordsville. Okay. Thank you. Thank he's you. A, I, I, I will. Class, he's a class agent for the class of 66. And, oh. and he probably knows that beta song. <laughs> Someone said, so now we're doing beta testing. Uh, we're forever, forever in the beta stage, forever in development. So, okay. So Chris Barker says also in 2016, when Richard Bowen, the Glee Club uh, performed yet another version we called old, old Wabash that you hadn't shown. That's true. So I bet there's, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. For, um, this is an important lesson when I when I'm teaching about music, like say from the ninth or the tenth century. I'm like, this is not uh, this is not what happened. This is what surviving sources based on current interpretation tell suggest what happened. You know, I always encourage my students, you know, pretend like you're you know you're admitting something into evidence in court. You know, this is not representative of uh, the past entirely we have to keep our critical distance so yeah i'm there it, it, the surviving sources they're invaluable but we have to ah yes the ur text you're correct thank you robert <laughs> yeah so uh yeah so tons and tons of valuable lessons about uh, how to do history how to do musicology how to do stylistic analysis yeah all right, Dr. Abels, I have a question of my own um, if, in these last couple of minutes. Um, we've joked about my football team being the Longhorns, which is true, but yeah. I'm from South Bend, so everyone around me are Notre Dame fans. And when I was in high school, they taught us to remember the quadratic formula to the tune of the Notre Dame song, which I don't know the words to because I don't like Notre Dame, but I can tell you it's X equals negative B plus or minus the square root of... And so I'm wondering, do other fight songs get used that way? Not necessarily the words, but the melodies get taken out of the fight song context huh. and used in other areas of life. Because to this day, I'm 25, and that's how I have to remember that equation. Oh, 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 sure. You know, I and uh, and the role of music being an, a valuable mnemonic is is so important historically. Yeah, you know, when I talk to my students about like a medieval plain chants and how you know how these cloistered monks could remember could remember so many texts because they put it to music and I say I I'm an adult I am a professional and but I have to sing the ABC song every time I alphabetize something it's I'm not proud of that um so but I, but I'm sure and as a native Texan I, I I'm I, I'm struggling to think of uh, something that uses UT or a and because like as a child, you had to pick a side it didn't matter. Yeah. yeah, if you had any allegiance or any connection to UT or a and you still needed to pick one. Uh, so I but that that has to be yeah uh, the 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 musicological term for that is contrafact. Uh, when you take an existing song and you rewrite the lyrics to it, um, so any any so commercial jingles that use existing songs and uh, and they change the lyrics, you know, it, it's it, it's a pretty common practice. Yeah. Uh, in uh, the 18th century, there was a very uh, there's a whole genre of songs called broadside ballads, and uh, these were uh, ephemeral. Uh, very easily printed, easily discarded uh, lyrics uh, to songs, and it was uh, they were all uh, using pre-existing melodies. So you would have a satirical song about something, or um, mm -hmm. some kind of promotional song, 
and, and but there was always the assumption there that everyone knows this tune so let me write some right. words to it, making fun of uh right. this politician or this businessman or, or or whatever so yeah so contrafacts have been around for a really long time and they're very effective at uh, getting people to remember things and by extension uh influencing people and and or selling things <laughs> or <laughs> knowing their quadratic equations yeah all right well thank you so much is there one final question i know we're a couple minutes over and i want to be respectful of dr abel's time molly can you hear me yes sir <clears throat> three or four decades ago a DePaul guy <laughs> wrote the words to wabash cannonball and it's a very clever song and really quite favorable to wabash i have a tape cassette of it and I will try to bring it over to you because you really have to hear it. I, I agree. I, I really need to hear this. Yes. And I will get it to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right. Well, Dr. Abels, thank you again. Uh, it is favorable despite referring to us as the cavemen. Is that the song that you guys are talking about that plays the... Um, there's like a, a video on YouTube around the bell game, or is that the Monon Bell railroad song? Yeah, I think I've seen that on YouTube. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Dr. Abels, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I, I had a lot of fun and uh, I, I look forward to seeing you all at the bell game. Sounds good. I will. This tonight was recorded and I will send everyone the link and it will be up on YouTube in a couple of business days. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Dr. Abels. Bye-bye, folks. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Abels. Good to see you. You too. <laughs>